for questions. So without further ado, our first presenter, Dr. Sheth, and uh, if you'll, um, you very much, Dr. Carter. microphone's on. I think so. Okay. Test? Yes. All right, very good. Thank you. Okay. Good morning, everyone. I hope you had a nice break. Everybody's pretty energized. I am Dr. Devam Sheth from Youngstown, Ohio, currently a second year resident from Western Reserve Health Education. Anyone from Ohio? No? All right. So I guess everyone has heard about tumor lysis syndrome, is that right? Anyone in the room who hasn't heard about tumor lysis? All right. So I am presenting here a case that was kind of unusual as it was a delayed tumor lysis syndrome and that's why it's interesting. Um, a 72 year old Caucasian male recently diagnosed with stage 4 adenocarcinoma of the gastroesophageal junction comes to the hospital after two weeks after receiving his last chemotherapy cycle with complaints of generalized weakness, fatigue and abdominal discomfort. Review of systems is uh, remarkable for um, lethargy, fatigue, um, nausea since past few days. On physical exam, um, he was a pretty nice gentleman who was lethargic. Uh, his abdomen was grossly distended, non tender to touch, uh, secondary to ascites. Um, talking about his uh, chemotherapy, he had received an in increased dose of carboplatin and paclitaxel just two weeks ago. Uh, due to that, his cell count had come down and so he was given colon stimulating factor. On admission his vitals were stable, he was not hypotensive or tachycardic, he looked pretty fine so we just ran some blood tests on him. As you can see on admission his white cell count was elevated 21, his creatinine was 2.7 which was 1 from 2 weeks ago before his chemotherapy was started. At phosphorus was quietly elevated at 7 and his LFTs were elevated, which we thought was secondary to his liver meds. So at the time of admission, we thought that his white cell count could be probably due to infection or it could be just due to the colon stimulating factor that we gave him. So we pan cultured him, we gave him broad spectrum antibiotics, and we loaded him with fluids because he did look dehydrated. Regarding his kidney function, we thought that probably looking at his albumin and his current uh, volume status, he was dehydrated. We just want to make sure that he is not retaining urine, he's not obstructed. We got an ultrasound of his abdomen, made sure that uh, there's no hydronephrosis, which was not there. We loaded him with about three, four liters of fluids in a couple of hours. As you can see, his urine output was just 250 cc's per day. So at the end of the day, when his clinical status did not improve, there was a suspicion that something else is going on and things are not fitting together. So we ordered a stat uric acid level and it came back 14.4, which is quite elevated. So this, this, con this confirmed our suspicion of tumor lysis syndrome and nephrology and hemato-oncology were consulted stat and they also agreed. And uh, we gave him raspberry case, which I'll talk about later on. So after that on day two, um, his white cell count came down uh, uric acid came down from 14.4 to 3, but his lactic acid jumped up from 6.3 to 13, and his kidneys were completely shut down. He was not clearing all the electrolytes that he had accumulated. And then we spoke to family to see if we can hemodialyze him so that he, he can improve. But since he was a stage 4 cancer patient, um, his family did not want him to suffer anymore, and we just made him comfortable. And he passed away in the next couple of hours. So this is the Cairo Bishop definition of tumor lysis syndrome. There are two types. The first criteria is laboratory tumor lysis syndrome, and the second one is clinical. For diagnosis of laboratory tumor lysis syndrome, we need at least two of these abnormalities. Increased uric acid, phosphate greater than 4.5, potassium greater than 6, calcium less than 7, or ionized calcium less than 1.12. For clinical tumor lysis, um, if the patient has any evidence of cardiac arrhythmias or seizures or neuromuscular symptoms like tetany, paresthesias, numbness, weakness, or if patient has nephropathy indicated by increased creatinine of 0.3 or a single value of 1.5 times the upper limit, or if the patient has oliguria. So in our patient, as you can see, 
his uric acid was about 14 and phosphorus was 7. So he did have both laboratory as well as clinical tumor lysis syndrome. So you, in patients like this, how, how can we know whether it's tumor lysis or not? It all, if you're looking for tumor lysis, then only you'll find tumor lysis in solid malignancies. So what kind of people are more prone to tumor lysis syndrome? Tumor lysis syndrome uh, is usually seen in, can in liquid cancers such as lymphomas, leukemias. It, is, it was rarely seen before, but now more and more case reports are being published um, with patients having solid malignancies like metastatic colon cancer, uterine cancer, lung cancer uh, with tumor lysis syndrome. It also depends on the cancer mass. If your cancer is a small lesion, you probably won't have that. But if, if the tumor load is quite high, if the tumor is metastat has metastasized to bones, liver, or any other organs, th there's a good chance your patient can develop this. Features of patient on presentation, if your patient is dehydrated, if patient has previous kidney injury, then that patient is more prone to tumor lysis. And as I said, cell lysis potential depends on the type of cancer, as well as what chemotherapy you are giving, how much sensitive the tumor is to the chemotherapeutic agent. Pathophysiology, the underlying mechanism lies in the release of nucleic acid and the various electrolytes that are within the cells. What happens is the nucleic acids get metabolized to uric acid. This uric acid uh, precipitates as uric crystals in kidneys and that leads to shutdown of the kidneys and then the vicious cycle just goes on. The body is not able to clear the uric acid and it just keeps on piling up. The other mechanism is uh, there is release of a lot of cytokines which activates the inflammatory response system in your body and the patient uh, is caught in a vicious cycle of inflammation and that can be explained by the same process as well. In our patient, what probably, why, why is this a delayed tumor lysis? Number one, usually tumor lysis is seen between three to seven days of giving chemotherapy but this patient had his chemotherapy about two weeks ago so our anticipation or our hypothesis is that probably because of the chemotherapy which was platinum based, there is delayed clearance of platinum from the body which led to an increased effect on the tumor and that's why the tumor lies a little late. How, so how, once you have a diagnosis of tumor lysis syndrome, how, how do we manage that? The key to management is just to prevent tumor lysis. When you are anticipating tumor lysis in your patient, you stratify them by their risk factors, whether the patient is low risk, intermediate or high risk, and you load them with fluids at the time of chemotherapy. You do not want to wait for tumor lysis syndrome to set in. So how much fluid? The, there, there, there is no clear cut answer for how much fluid, but you can gauge your fluid uh, by looking at the urine output and the recommendation is about two to three cc's per kg per hour. If the patient is making this much urine, you can be pretty sure that the patient is pretty hydrated. Now, once the tumor lysis syndrome sets in, what to do? Raspberrycase is a newer agent which will lyse the uric acid into allantoin, which can be easily excreted by your kidneys. Previously, we used to use allopurinol, but now uh, studies have proven that raspberrycase is much more, is better than allopurinol in clearance of uric acid. Raspberrycase is quite expensive, so somebody might argue that why, why give such an expensive drug to a terminal patient, but research has shown that if patient receives raspberry case, about five doses are good enough to get the patient back on his feet. Whereas if patient gets just allopurinol, if we consider the cost of hemodialysis and ICU stay and length of duration in hospital, raspberry case treatment turns out to be much cheaper. So um, electrolyte correction, um, in the initial phase we can be just conservative, but uh, what I have seen is that eventually most of the patients, they are not able to clear phosphate or potassium on their own and they need brief hemodialysis and a lot of people do get better. And in previous times it was thought that alkalinization of urine might help in removal of uric acid because your pH is high and uric acid becomes more soluble in high pH. But what happens is calcium phosphate precipitation increases if you alkalinize your urine. So it is no longer recommended to give any IV bicarbonate therapy. And I'll take some questions.